TV here that trash is pure angst. I don't see why it says that. And no holes barred assault on the senses. What a load of rubbish. Oh, oh. Your love for me. The teleprompter's moving too fast. I guess freedom means I can say what I want instead of reading what's up there. I really don't know what the f I'm saying. <laughs> Top 40 will never be the same. Either will the opportunity of me to do anything like this ever again. Even though some artists were there to receive their cherished awards, the coveted cracked skull, many groups seem to be absent. Who said Jerry's edition was going to be here, you liar? Yeah, I'm taking it home. All this right. is mine. Thanks. And I'm going to accept this award for uh, the Queensryche lads, for Jeff and all the boys. Uh, these bands could not be here tonight, but we appreciate accepting them awards on their behalf. Oh, you're here. You're here. All right. Whoa. What became more and more interesting throughout the gala evening wasn't the awards, but rather the award show itself. For example, the most professional moment. Oh, I'm eating something. Hold on a second. The most clearly made point. And if you hadn't seen us live, it's all a part of living. The best acceptance speech. Now I have something to hold all my bills down. The most anxious to detach themselves from the awards. I mean, I'm more of a... A filmmaker than a, a person that sort of, you know, carries the metal flag. I love metal music, but I'm not, you know, it's not like it doesn't run in my blood. The evening's performance highlight. You know, Prince spent $100,000 to have the same stage show that they just did. I think it was just kind of silly tonight, more than anything. <laughs> L.A. Metal. Right now we're outside the former site of one of San Francisco's most renowned rock clubs, the Old Waldorf. What's the story on this place? This is where there was a lot of metal shows in the early 80s, and this is where Metallica played some of our best shows in the fall of 82. And, much more important, this is where me and Kirk first met. And this is San Francisco. Well, as you know, school is back in session, and uh, we, recently went, we recently went to the city of Philadelphia to gauge the national student mood. Take a look. He's joined on the corner of Geary and Van Ness here in San Francisco, which is exactly the place where five years ago this month, Metallica hired a new bass player. What was it like? What exactly did you what say to Jason? What was his name again? <laughs> what was his name? <laughs> ja Jim. John. Jason. Jason. Oh, Jason. Jason. It was Jason. Like, how, did, how did this happen? Was well, it an emotional we were, scene? We were holding auditions uh, a few miles from here, and then we basically nailed it down to two people, and we wanted to spend some time with each of them to see if we could like hang with them and so on. So, obviously, the real test is can they come out and drink with us so we took Jason down here we'd been out with a guy the other guy the day before we took Jason down here we were consuming beverages at about one o'clock so me James and Kirk kind of ended up meeting in the bathroom up here and uh, we were standing there relieving ourselves and basically looked at each other and said is that the guy and we just kind of all just you know nodded and said yeah that's him we came back sat down around this very table and I basically you can be you can be Jason yeah. I mean okay well, 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 I just basically looked at him and I said, hey man, want a job? And this is what he did. <laughs> <laughs> Woo wow. It scared everybody what a, out what of a moment that must have been. <laughs> and, then, and then we thought twice about this. <laughs> but from then on, it's been straight downhill. <laughs> this, is, this is the beginning of the end. Okay, well, it's we a, little, love you too, so a little bit of history here at uh, Tommy's joint. We're going to take a quick break right now, but we'll be back with lots more San Francisco with our hosts and guides, Metallica, so don't go away. Welcome back to The Week in Rock, where we're taking our tour of the San Francisco Bay Area with Lars and Kirk of Metallica. Guys, we're in the Triple Rock. That's what this is now? Yeah, this yes. is our uh, neighborhood-friendly home brewery. An institution with us. Yeah, we come here and have a lot of uh, attempted band meetings that usually don't last very long. Failed band meetings. <laughs> this is pretty, I can imagine why they fail. This is pretty strong stuff. Yeah, this is... Uh, we, yeah. <laughs> oh to my you. god, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> this place was introduced to us by a friend of ours named Dan R., who is... Uh, James's personal bodyguard. Yeah. <laughs> God, Good to you know. heard that name, here first. Name check for him. Okay, right now, uh, some fashion news for those of you on a beer budget. It concerns the work of a New York City designer named Anna Sui. She started out 10 years ago making fashions in her apartment in New York. And the idea was to make kicky stuff that you could afford to buy. Radio station KUSF, which is much like others you may have seen, except that back in the mid-80s, it was one of the first stations ever to really pump Metallica really hard. What was happening back here in those days, guys? Well, well, well. Um, oh. 
hole. Every Saturday night, basically, um, between you know midnight and eight in the morning, this guy named Ron Quintana, mm. who was actually the guy that I stole the name Metallica from. He, Where did uh, you steal it from? Well, he was uh, asking me. We used to hang out. He was uh, uh, starting a magazine. He asked me what he should call his magazine. He had a short list of names, and the name Metallica was on there. So I told him to call it Metal Mania. <laughs> kept Metallica for myself. Well, this guy used to have a radio show down here called Rampage Radio, and every Saturday night between 12 and 8, everybody would just come down here from wherever in the Bay Area and just hang out wow. and get up to all kinds of crap down here. Like, like what? Getting up to what? <laughs> <laughs> this would be. Well, I'm, first of all, we'd come roaring in with our bottles of vodka, you know, and just grab the mic and scream a bunch of vulgarities <laughs> into the mic live over the air and bump into the, the turntable and watch the, the needle go skimming across the record. <laughs> This is days are long gone. Yeah. <laughs> we, used to, we used to just take over the place. I, know. I think things have settled down quite a bit here. We'll come do this at MTV soon. We'll come to a radio station near you if you want them to. Meanwhile, back in New York again, those who still revere the 70s TV show The Brady Bunch will be happy to know that it lives on on stage in lower Manhattan at the Village Gate, as you're about to see. Get or not. Okay, we wound up here at the uh, Oakland Stadium, the site of this weekend's big day on The Green Show, starring Faith No More, Soundgarden, Queensryche, and of course, the mighty Metallica <laughs> here with us. It's going to be quite a show. If you're not in the area and you can't see it, there'll be an MTV News special one-hour show wrapping up everything that happens here, and that'll start airing on Monday at 11 a.m. Try and catch that. And if you can't be here and still want to see Metallica live in the flesh, you're going out on tour, right? Yeah, we yep. start in... Um Peoria, Illinois, of all places, on uh, October 29th, and the first leg runs up through Christmas. Uh, it's mostly the Midwest and the Northeast, so there you go. <laughs> Great. Well, you've seen some other Day on the Green shows here, right? Anything uh, really yeah. memorable? Yeah, I saw Led Zeppelin here in 1977. That was a great show. Oh. This is incredible. And when he uh, was six years old. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, actually, we, all, uh, uh, we also played a Day on the Green in 1985. With the Scorpions! Yeah, we were supporting the Scorpions. Opening for the Scorpions. And you saw Peter Frampton here, too. Yeah, I saw yeah. Peter Frampton here and Leonard Skinner. Wow. It was great because Peter Frampton got belted with hot dogs and <laughs> sodas and, and everything. Don't get any ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think we might say those were the days. You, know? you had <laughs> to be here. Days. Okay, well, this has been great. Thanks for taking part in this, showing us around well, thank town. Thank you. It's yeah. been great. And uh, we'll be back again on Monday uh, at 8 p.m. 7 Central with The Day in Rock. We hope to see you then. Have a good weekend. See you soon. Later. For those of you just tuning in, there's an encore presentation of the Week in Rock tomorrow at 1 o'clock noon central, right after the Top 20 Video Countdown. Right now, stay tuned for the big picture up next on MTV. MTV's The Weekend Rock is... This week, a day of metal on the green in California. Motley Crue turns 10 at number 2. Jesus Jones winds up a wild year in New York City. Some of the world's greatest guitarists gather in Seville. And a look at the women of rap in concert. Hi, I'm Kurt Loder. Welcome to The Week in Rock. Concert promoter Bill Graham has been producing day on the green shows in the San Francisco Bay Area since 1973. And over the years, a procession of acts ranging from Led Zeppelin and The Who to Wham! and New Kids on the Block have topped the bills. This year's day on the green held at Oakland Stadium last Saturday starred Soundgarden, Faith No More, Queensryche, and unveiling a new two-and-a-half-hour set, the Bay Area's own Metallica. Here's how it all went. How the f*** did all of you guys wake up early enough to make it for this? One day on the green concert was an eye opener, all right. Crowding over 40,000 metal fans into Oakland Stadium for a full day of all star headbang. <laughs>
It's got some posters in the dressing room that are like cool, the snake kind of yeah. twirling itself around the Bay Bridge. Bill Graham gave us a nice robe too. Yeah, we got excellent robes, which <laughs> you don't usually get when you're out on your own. Yeah, now I need a pipe and a smoking jacket. <laughs> I'm, I'm set. The Soundgarden won't have much time to sit around in their robes since they'll be opening the next leg of the Guns N' Roses tour starting next month. And Day on the Green headliners Metallica will kick off their own tour October 29th, debut their new set for their hometown audience. Having recently hit number one on the charts with their latest album, Metallica got a true taste of the big time through their guest list, which grew to over a hundred people for this homecoming gig. I have a lot of relatives. Let's just say, just leave it at that. A lot of relatives and a lot of people who've called me coincidentally to say hi. You know? And oh, I heard that uh, you're playing some show somewhere. Yeah, okay. How many tickets do you need? Day on the Green, 1991. Metallica, by the way, will be taking its two-and-a-half-hour show on the road starting October 29th in Peoria, Illinois. In chart news, Motley Crue entered the Billboard album list this week at number two with its Decade of Decadence LP, a greatest hit celebration of music, makeup, and aggressive hairstyling. Here's a quick look back with the boys. On the album we have... 10 of our greatest hits, which we, which we like, and two soundtrack songs that were never released on a Motley record, and then two brand new tracks. But how to figure which hits are the greatest? Motley Crue decided their song selection should be a balanced representation of their 10 years of work, rather than a mere popularity contest. When the Dr. Feelgood really came to the uh, decision on what song should be on there, you know, of course we want to put Dr. Feelgood on, but then there's so many other good songs like Same Situation, Should That Be On There, or Don't Go Away Mad, or, and, uh, but, you know, it is decade of decadence, and it, it is a celebration of our 10 years together, and, and that's what uh, Kickstart My Heart was all about, and so that, we, we decided to put a live track of that on there. This is Livewire, Peace Your Action, which are both remixes, um, What's the next record? Shout the Devil, Looks Kill. Um, Smoking in the Boys' Room. Home Sweet Home. And then uh, Wild Side, Girls and Girls Girls Girls. Dr. Feel Good. Live Kickstart. Um, a song called Rock and Roll Junkie that was on the Ford Fairlane soundtrack. And then the song Teaser, which was on the uh, another soundtrack album with that Tommy Bolin cover. And then the two new tracks and Anarchy in the UK. All right. Anarchy in the UK, a cover of the Sex Pistols classic, is one of the previously unreleased tracks crew threw into Decade of Decadence. There are also two new originals, Angela and the first single in video, Primal Scream. Primal Scream is full on, blown out rock. It's great. It's heavy. Actually, we had three songs we were going to put on this record, but um, we were messing around with Anarchy in the UK, and we decided to take one of them off, which is a song called Punched in the Teeth by Love. And uh, we're going to save that fight for the next crew record. While looking ahead to next year's all new crew album, the Motleys are still trying to get used to the fact that they've been around as long as they have. It's gone by so fast. You know, and even with, with MTV, I mean, we started at the same time. You know, you guys' 10 year anniversary is coming up, right? You know, it's our 10 year anniversary, and it's, I mean, time, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Over in England, meanwhile, Genesis is preparing to release its first new album in five years next month. And among the tracks on it is a song written by frontman Phil Collins for his friend Eric Clapton. The song, called Since I Lost You, was written in memory of Clapton's four-year-old son, Connor, who was killed in a fall from a New York City apartment window last March. Our colleagues at MTV Europe asked Collins about the track during a video shoot in London recently, and he seemed still shaken by the boy's death. I wrote the song, the lyrics. Um, 
the day after it happened, pretty much. And uh, and I don't really want to talk too much about it. I mean, because it, it looks like I'm just just talking about it is the wrong thing to do, you know. But there is a song that, that since I lost you on the album, is not about you know boy meets girl, boy loses girl. It's about something losing someone. Yeah, losing somebody very close to you. We Can't Dance, the Genesis album containing Colin's song for Eric Clapton, will be released on November 12th. We're going to let you run off to the kitchen for a moment right now, but we'll be back with Jesus Jones in New York City, an all-star guitar festival over in Spain, an all-woman rap concert, and Vanilla Ice laughing back at third base. Don't go away. malevolent creation rule, it's pretty much a worldview. How serious is this stuff? Well, let's take a look. Death metal style is anything that is just pure death. Its intensity is what it's about. It's down home, good fun. Tell me what this is about. Kill for Satan. What's in a name? How about a song title? Call it sick punk. Call it grindcore. Call it... Death metal is the thing now. It's the thing of the 90s, really. That has all the power. It's the extremity of it. Death metal is the most extreme form of music that there is. There are no boundaries. Rock and roll, you know, if you get a little heavy, well, you're heavy metal. Heavy metal, if you get a little fast, well, you're speed metal. Death metal is like the final word. Where are you going to go? destruction are the bedrock of much of death metal's lyrics. Some bands, like Carcass, prefer nausea to doom, their lyrics far too disgusting to air. But the bands say there is a point to all this offensiveness. The gore is, uh, it's A, shock value, it's B, like the idea of brutality, of just, you know, sickness, of just overwhelming, just, you know, filth and debauchery, and the idea that, you know, in society we've been conditioned to, uh, like be kind of against that and kind of like you know frown upon stuff like that but who's to say what's good or evil you know it's what you make speaking of evil a number of death metal bands say they are into satanism in one way or another though the bands we talk to seem more interested in cultural rebellion than dark deities satan represents freedom rebellion against any kind of an establishment that would put boundaries on someone that would bind someone's wrists and, and put them into a mold and make them into something that is not their choice of their free will. It's just a way of reacting to the, to the way things are these days, you know? It's, it's quite natural, really. They may sound serious or maybe just silly, but plenty of musicians and fans agree that the primary purpose of death metal isn't death or devils, it's about a good time. It is purely fantasy entertainment, and you know it should be handled that way. It's all about en entertainment, you know. You just can't take it seriously, you know. You just gotta appreciate it for the music. It's like a movie, you know. You don't go out and like see somebody after seeing a movie or the same with this stuff. In cheerier news, the National Association of Brick... Palooza Package Tour, starring the Red Hot Chili Peppers, Pearl Jam, and the new Perry Farrell band, Porno for Pyros, among other acts, kicked off near San Francisco last weekend. Our man Dave Kendall was on hand, and here's his report. Uh, I was here last year, I had a great time, and I'm back for some more. I'm the host tonight, and I'm going to introduce all the group. There's a lot of flavors going around today. You've got the second stage with the Booyah Tribe, Cypress Hill, Porno for Pyros. Here we go! 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 Here
People with weak constitution generally faint at some point of the show. But if you're really smart or if you want to have a great time, if we get to a certain thing that's starting to disturb you, well, look away and watch people watch it. I mean, that's fun, too. No, we want to send the roadies bungee jumping before they uh, go on stage just to keep them on their toes, you know? You guys are playing second on the bill. But why so early? A lot of people might have thought you'd be, uh, you know, co-headliner or something. Well, that was the, the reason that we decided to do the tour is because, uh, I mean, if we could play early, uh, we could, we get a chance to see the rest of the band. So uh, it, it, it's a low-pressure situation. We're at the point where it's the end of our touring year, and it's going to be good just to go out and have fun. here because we want to play to like a selection of different types of people. You know you're walking around just checking out the stuff, you know, looking at the girls and then you know you check out some stuff and learn something. learn about things or you can just go beat on the big metal thing. One, two, three, four! It's loud and uh, it's getting your ears all and then ready for the, uh, for the show. I know. I think, you know, people have probably one group that they really came to see, but uh, are going to be able to bear with and learn a lot about the other groups that's on here too, including the rap group. I've heard a lot about ministry. I meant to be a bit crazy. One of the kind of stipulations that we wanted to make sure that uh, we went on at night as opposed to during the day. I don't know what time you wake up, but... I try not to see too much sun, you know, I'm, I'm not a real big picnic type of guy, you know, it's like wine and cheese and like thrash music is, I don't know, it's a bit weird. Dude, four, six, eight, who do we appreciate? Arif, Arif, the freak. Lollapalooza was one of the hottest tours of the summer and with most of the 36 dates already sold out it looks like Lollapalooza 2 is going to be even bigger. Also hitting the road last weekend, this time in Washington, D.C., was a very hard, hard rock tour starring Guns N' Roses, Metallica, and Faith No More. The opening date ran for seven and a half hours, various moments of which looked like this. It's been anticipated as the biggest tour of the summer. Co-headliners Guns N' Roses and Metallica, along with opening act Faith No More, began their trek across America at Washington, D.C.'s RFK Stadium last week. The show was a major success, despite, among other challenges, the very intense heat. While I was sitting up on stage and I looked up, they had this like temperature gauge or thing and whatever up there. I look up, and it's like it's 105 degrees. It's sitting on the thing. I'm going like, why am I doing this? Isn't isn't this stuff dangerous to do? With each act only a few weeks off from their last tour leg, getting the music right is one aspect of this show that nobody is worried about. Guns N' Roses says they're so well oiled that the band needed only a single day of preparation, and that without singer Axl Rose, to rehearse a few oldies for the tour. Axl had no concerns about missing the practice. Once the music's there, it's kind of like getting in a car and driving it when the, when the car is completely tuned and, and it's running well and you, you know how to drive, drive the car. It's, it's like when the, when the band's got the song down, I know the song. With Faith No More opening the show in the afternoon and Guns N' Roses closing well after midnight, Metallica's middle slot puts them in the unusual position of playing under both sun and lights at the same gig. You start when it's still daylight and then you get the whole transformation into like nighttime and stuff. It's great playing right at, right at twilight and stuff like that. So I'm really happy with the slot that we have here and it's, uh, it's cool. 
only low energy point in this seven and a half hour extravaganza takes place after Metallica's set ends. That's when the great juggling act of getting Metallica's enormous customized stage off and Guns N' Roses' enormous customized stage on begins. You know, the set change between us and Metallica's an hour and 15 because, I mean, they're, they're both big productions and instead of turning the stage around like most bands do, we have to um, take down the Metallica stuff and put our stuff up and it's, it takes a long time. So by the time we get, we get on, unfortunately, most of the kids are burnt out. <laughs> The band certainly aren't burnt out, and that's a good thing, because nobody here will be getting rest anytime soon. Both Metallica and Guns N' Roses will return to their own tours in the fall. But for now, this mega tour marches on, a testament the band say to their no-compromise careers. It's more of an accomplishment to get all these bands who are so much against the system and against the industry standards and pull it together and make it the biggest thing of the summer. I mean, that's, that built, there's a sense of accomplishment, so yeah, you're excited. Finally, on Thursday night, more than four years after the start of his last outing, Bruce Springsteen, for the first time in his career, launched a U.S. tour in his native New Jersey. It was the first of 11... And Aerosmith's coming up later on this... This week, the death toll rises in last week's tragic stampede at a rap charity basketball game. There's still more questions than answers about security for the event, and we take an in-depth look at the ups and downs of concert security. Hi, I'm Tabitha Soren, and this is The Week in Rock. The first week of The Week in Rock. Last weekend's CCNY tragedy was the worst incident of its kind since December 1979, when 11 WHO fans were trampled to death in a rush for general admission seats at a Cincinnati concert. The CCNY stampede came almost a year after a similar incident last January in Salt Lake City, where three teenagers were crushed to death in the front rows of an ACDC concert as the crowd pressed toward the stage. That tragedy, along with a grand jury investigation into claims of violent abuse of fans by security at the New Jersey Meadowlands, prompted us to put together the following report last summer on concert security, how it can go wrong, and how it's supposed to work. We are the interface between the crowd and the band. We're the people that are responsible for making sure the crowd has a good time without overstepping certain boundaries. <laughs> up a fight, then we use equal force to remove them from the property. The security industry has grown up because of concert violence, which is as old as rock and roll itself. Back in the 50s, Bill Haley fans rioted. In the 60s, it was Rolling Stones fans, among others. And the potential for violence remains today. But what causes concert violence? Usually it's the drinking, you know, if somebody's drinking a little bit too much, they get a little bit out of hand. Then there's general admission or festival seating. Sometimes in the Midwest, there, there's problems because they have, you know, they still have the general audiences and stuff like that, which is, there's no seating. So there's a lot of people questioning each other, which is kind of stupid. There's no question that a festival seated type of venue, especially the bigger the venue, would lend, lend itself towards more problems with the crowd, more difficult crowd control, that type of thing. Festival seating also offers the opportunity for slam dancing. That's a very rowdy expression of dance and creates more volatile situations. Yourself, man. It's survival of the fittest in there. Ironically, though, security itself is sometimes the cause of concert violence. For starters, security guards sometimes expect the worst after seeing what fans bring to shows in their pockets. We just get boxes of, of weapons, box cutters, knives, uh, all kinds of things of that nature. Billy clubs, so they, they take everything. Got in, big fight, knife came out, and uh, had to go in and break that up. That's not too fun. And fans sometimes like to give security staffers unwarranted grief. You know, if you give these guys a hard time, they'll mess with you back, basically. They will swallow a lot of abuse from, from some fans, but you just gotta let it go, let it slide. Sometimes even the band harasses the security team. I gotta be playing a song, this hand keep going, 
I had this hand grabbing some security guy, Shane up going, what are you doing? You know, and sometimes Tom would stop and do the same thing, kick him in the head, you know, like, because that's what they're doing to kids, they're kicking him in the head. Part of the problem is that security guards often have little in the way of qualifications. Many major venues require only that job applicants pass a true or false test. And sometimes the only other condition is that applicants must not have any felonies on their police records. There may be like one professional, and that's the head security man that stays backstage on his walkie-talkie, too scared to go out in the audience. So yeah, they don't have, they don't need no more security, but they need better security. Better security means ruling out violence as an option. It takes a certain personality to resist fighting back. We try to determine that in our screening process before we hire someone. Without security, it's care and concern for the customer that comes in through the door rather than interrogation, like, oh, get back, right. you know, smack on the head, um, you know, I got a gun, so you better be good type, you know. Because most rock concerts require special arrangements, unlike sporting events, for example, some artists try to give special instructions to security staffers, but they're not always heeded. Yeah, sometimes we talk to the guys, and um, they say to themselves, they, tell, they tell us, like, yo, we know our jobs, you know, sometimes they had they hire certain they hire police officers, and the police officers don't want to hear nothing from nobody. Some security people may not do a very good job because they're underpaid. When you pay somebody four or five dollars an hour, you lead yourself into that situation. If people aren't happy with their jobs, if people aren't happy with their supervisors, their bosses. Essentially, good security comes down to good screening, good training, good pay, and good supervision. You know, a lot of times you put a t-shirt on, on a guy who doesn't have a responsibility for uh, treating people with kindness and you'll impose his muscles on you and it might break your arm or your thumb. Uh, just like we get training, they need training and, and constantly and how to serve with pride and respect. Concert security. In other news, rapper Bismarcky and 70s pop singer... Station, you